Hi class, this is your instructor, Skyler Huff, and welcome back. So we've now moved on to the third chapter of your text, and this is the chemistry of life, organic compounds. So both inorganic and organic forms of carbon occur widely in nature, and many types of organic compounds will become incorporated into the body of the baby, or even of that plant, or even of that hummingbird you see. So as this happens, those organic compounds are those in which carbon atoms are covalently bonded to one another to form the backbone of the molecule. Some very simple carbon compounds are considered inorganic if the carbon is not bonded to another carbon or to hydrogen. The carbon dioxide we exhale is a waste product from the breakdown of organic molecules to obtain energy, and that's just one example of an inorganic carbon compound. Organic compounds are so named because at one time it was thought that they could only be produced by living or organic organisms. So Frederick Wehler synthesized urea, that metabolic race, that metabolic waste. So as it happens, meaning scientists have learned to synthesize many organic molecules and have discovered that organic compounds are not found, of course, in any organism. So of these organic compounds that exist today, I'll just put it as being that there are more than five many of those that have been identified, and there are many reasons for this diversity. So with this wide array, it's those three-dimensional shapes that are produced by them. Further, those carbon atom forms with those bonds and a greater number of different elements than does any type of atom. In addition to that, those chemical groups containing atoms of other elements, especially oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus and sulfur can profoundly change the properties of an organic molecule. So the diversity that also results from the fact that many organic compounds found in organisms are extremely large macromolecules, which cells construct from simpler modular subunits. For example, protein molecules are built from those smaller compounds known as amino acids. So as we continue through this chapter, just keep in mind that you will develop an understanding of the major groups of organic compounds found in organisms, including the carbohydrates, the lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids, known as DNA and RNA. So, before I get to the answer to questions I may have to pose, just keep in mind that this is getting you to that basis of understanding to where you can, of course, perform with the course. So with that, why are these compounds of central importance to all living things? So even though you may or may not know this answer, let's get to, of course, why this answer is important. Because as we get there, you'll get to evidence that all living things evolve from a common ancestor. And evolution provides a powerful explanation for the similarities of molecules that constitute structures of cells and tissues that participate in and regulate metabolic reactions and transmit information, including providing energy for life processes. So here we are to begin things. So as it states, covalent bonded carbon atoms are that backbone of these molecules. So with what I've just stated here, keep in mind that it's by that sharing of electrons. So as we are here, it just mentions that the carbon atom can complete its valent shell by forming a total of four covalent bonds. And that is why those organic compounds are not just so numerous, but of course, so varied because all of the other elements of the other atoms that can, of course, bind with it, bond with it chemically. So carbon to carbon bonds are strong, and they're not easily broken. And as I mentioned in the last lecture, that's why we have those single bonds, those double bonds, and even those triple bonds. So having gotten to that, we're going to keep on moving to the next portion here. We just mentioned that the shape of the molecule can determine its biological properties and function. And keep this in mind, meaning these shapes here. So as you look at benzene, the bottom left there, you'll see that benzene is right there in the center. And looking at those hydrogens that are bonded with those carbons, with those double bonds that you see right there. And then the very same can be said about methane, CH4. So these shapes are integral into how they interact and the basic function of these molecules. So now we'll move down to isomers. So getting to isomers, I'll call those isomers being compounds with the same molecular formulas 
but different structures. Thus, they have different properties. So, so with that, it's just meaning that the same components can link in more than one pattern and giving that variety of molecular shapes. So with that, it's usually one isomer that is biologically active and the other of which not being biologically active. So from here, we'll give you three types of isomers. And the first of which we have here is you see ethanol to the left here, excuse me. The first one we see here is ethanol. Give me just a moment here. So this is ethanol here, C2H6O. And you see the very same thing with, of course, the dimethyl ether, C2H6O. So they have that very same formula, but of course they're just different. And of course we have the trans-2 and the cis-2 butene. And I won't do it with our third and final example, at least not at this moment, but of course those are in a in nantanomers. And I won't do it with those isomers, but as these isomers are, they're mirror images of one another. And that central carbon that we have in there, that central carbon we have, since I have it on the screen, I guess I should mention it. With that central carbon, it's, of course, that asymmetrical because it's bonded to four different groups. And because of the three-year structure, the two figures cannot be superimposed no matter how they're rotated. So there you have it. And that, of course, will be that in an antiomers. So now we've made it on to one of the very important parts of the chapter, getting to those function groups. Because as it states at the very top of the screen, function groups change the properties of those organic molecules. And if you're wondering how, we're getting into how now. So, yes, there are isomers. But along with that, we have hydrocarbons. So, because those covalent bonds between the hydrogen and the carbon are nonpolar, it's because those hydrocarbons lack distinct charged regions. So when they lack those distinct charged regions, those hydrocarbons, they are insoluble in water, and they stick together or begin to cluster. So as they cluster together, they form those hydrophobic reactions, and it's all because of those hydrocarbons. And on the converse, in the event that you happen to replace one hydrogen with one or more functional groups, it changes those characteristics greatly. So with that, that's where we get down to having, of course, the polar and ionic functional groups. And with those, they are hydrophilic. And I can understand that that may not mean a much to you yet, but as we continue on, I know it'll mean a whole lot more. So let's begin here now with the methyl group. So beginning with this methyl group, as you have it, it's a nonpolar hydrocarbon group, a nonpolar hydrocarbon group. And since I've said it in such a way, that does in me, indeed mean that it's right there. You have that the R sitting there with a, with a CH3. And that's that methyl group. So next up, I guess I'll do, we've got that. we got this. The next will be the hydroxyl group. So with that hydroxyl group, and keep in mind that I just said that that's a nonpolar methyl group. Well, the hydroxyl group is polar. So it's polar because of that strong electronegative oxygen atom. If you all can think back to even us drawing out H2O back in the prior chapter, well, because of that electronegative oxygen, it is polar. And kind of think of that hydroxyl group, being that OH negative there, as being, of course, the hydrogen atom being bonded to an oxygen, as we kind of saw last chapter. And with that, we, we find a lot of these with the alcohols. Hence, of course, they typically end in the OL. And an example of this would be found in ethanol, the alcohol present in alcoholic beverages. So, yes, it is polar because of the electronegative oxygen, allowing, of course, the electrons to be drawn toward itself. So this attracts water molecules, and it helps to dissolve organic compounds such as sugars. Up next is the carbonyl group. 
So that carbonyl group is also polar. And we have that carbon atom that has that double covalent bond with, yet again, class, another oxygen. So having gotten to this point, I'll just say it just consists of that carbon atom with, it, with the oxygen atom joined by that double bond. And typical of these to be, of course, the alde aldehydes and the ketones. Typical to be the aldehydes and the ketones. And the simplest ketone is acetone. And, of course, you can call it propanol for being that propanol for the aldehyde. So a ketone and an aldehyde may be structural isomers with different properties, as in the case for acetone and propanolone. So up next will be that carboxyl group. So the carboxyl group is also polar. And since I've gotten to this carboxyl group, well, I'll take that back. I'm sorry. The carboxyl group, not the carbonyl group, but the carboxyl group is actually going to be weakly acidic. And we have the carbon that is joined by that double covalent bond to oxygen, and it's by a single covalent bond, and it's bonded to, of course, another oxygen to a hydrogen. So with this carboxyl, I'll make this a bit more concise. We usually find this with carboxylic acids or organic acids. So that means that acetic acid, which of course gives vinegar its sour, its sour taste, is all because of that carboxyl group. So it has its acidic properties because of the source of hydrogen ions. So going back to what we learned about, about inorganic chemistry and pH, those substances that, that are acidic are acidic because of the presence of those hydrogen ions, meaning that hydrogen ion power. So the covalent bond that's between the, the oxygen and the hydrogen is so polar that the hydrogen ions tend to dissociate reversibly. And of course, that's why we have the acetic acid. So in cells, this is found in its ionic form, and it's called carbox a carboxylic group in our cells. So up next is the amino group. So the amino group is weakly basic, and of course we have that NH3 that is ionized, or the NH2, which is not ionized. So let's get to, to a little bit more about the amine, amino group. So that nitrogen atom is there, and it's covalently bonded to two hydrogen atoms, that NH2. So we find these known as the amines. So please keep these, I guess I'll stay in your back pocket because we'll have a lot of information to be talked about the amines. So it's be, meaning an example I guess I'll give is going to be glycine. And I guess I'll just draw, since I'm giving examples, I'll, I'll draw this example because it's important to know this example. So we do have our N here. That's the letter N. And with our end, we'll give you our hydrogen that's here. Another hydrogen that's there. And I'm going to go back just a bit and clear my screen. I'm going to draw this a bit better. I'll start it over. So let's draw this amine, amine group. So I'll draw my hydrogen here. And I'm doing a much better job this time, class. So that's my hydrogen there, other hydrogen there. Here's the nitrogen. So having drawn that, I'll bond this to a carbon that's here. And with this, I'll go ahead and do yet another bond to a hydrogen there. That's a hydrogen there. And I'll have another hydrogen here. And then my carbon will be bonded with yet another carbon that's there. And then I'll have my double bonded oxygen there. And then my single bonded OH here. So if you look closely, the area in which you're paying the most attention to, at least at this moment, is right here. That is the amine group. And this is actually a class called glycine. G-L-O-I-C-I-N-E. That is glycine, the entire structure, that amino acid. So it's because it also has that carboxyl group, if you look closely, that carboxyl group. We have, of course, that double bonded oxygen, and of course, with our OH. So this is actually the carboxyl group I have circled there. So glycine is both an amine and a carboxylic acid. So those compounds with both groups class, meaning with that carboxylic acid, as well as that amine group, that amino group, are known class as amino acids. We'll be back at this class later, later in this very same chapter. So from here, 
So we'll move on to the phosphate group, another class, major important group. The phosphate group class is weakly acidic. So here we have the PO4 and the H2. And since we're here at the phosphate group, I'm going to draw out the phosphate group a bit briefly here at the bottom of our screen. So I'll put our central P, that fencil phosphorus. I'll do one my oxygen here at the top, just like that. And then I'll draw my oxygen there and my oxygen there. So here's my oxygen here. And there's another bond class with yet another oxygen that's there. And then another oxygen will be bonded here with the charge given there. So this class is what we'll get to when we get to the nucleic acids especially. So we'll get to amino acids with, of course, the proteins. And we'll get to, of course, this phosphate group with our amino acids. So as I was getting to class, the phosphate group can release one or two hydrogen ions, producing, of course, those ionized formed with two units of negative charge. So with that, just keep in mind, class, that we find this in those orga organic phosphates. And I guess I'll go down to, it's called glycerol phosphate, because we do have the phosphate groups being part of certain lipids. And functionally, this makes the molecule, which is a part of an anion, so, yes, it's negative charge, and this can transfer energy class between organic molecules. So this, excuse me, and one more will be the sulfur hydro group. So with that sulfur hydro group, it's pretty stable. So it's an atom of sulfur that's covalently bonded to a hydrogen. So this is found class in the thiols, the sulfur hydro is, such as ethane thiol. And with that, it's important in proteins, the sulfur hydro groups are. So from there, we're now getting into, I guess I'll say, the meat and potatoes class of the chapter. And if you're wondering what do I mean is, well, I mean we're here class at the macromolecules. So when I think of the macromolecules, I think of those as being large stru structures or colossal structures. And when I say large, I mean huge. It says here in your, in your presentation class, thousands of atoms. And these, of course, are what make up the proteins and nucleic acids. So most macromolecules are polymers. And keep in mind, class, a polymer is synthesized by way of covalently bonding together those known as monomers, or those smaller organic compounds. So as we get to this, I say just make sure you take your time to take some notes, and especially ask questions if you happen to not understand anything we're doing right now. So polymers, it states, they can be degraded. And they can be degraded class to those component monomers by way of the hydrolysis reaction. So let's talk hydrolysis reactions together. So that hydrolysis reaction class, that would, of course, take that huge polymer and break that polymer class down into its component monomers. And it does that class by, of course, by a hydrogen ion from water attaching, I repeat, by a hydrogen ion of water attaching to one monomer and the hydroxyl or that OH hydroxyl uh, to the other monomer. So with that, those monomers, they become covalently linked going in the other direction, covalently linked by condensation reactions. So we're doing two different things here. So by way of the hydrolysis reaction class, we can break down those large polymers into their component form, meaning what makes them up. So to speak, as let's go with Legos. If you have this huge wall of Legos that's built together, you could use, of course, water to break down that big wall of Legos into those smaller Lego pieces that you might step on and say, ouch, if that helps you with what I'm getting at. So I was saying on the converse, we could, of course, covalently link those monomers together class by way of the condensation reaction. So here in this presentation, they gave you class two separate definitions into one. So with the first, I guess I'll put A, we broke down polymers into monomers with A. You went from huge substance to smaller substance by way of class, the hydrolysis reaction. And on the opposite end of things, I'll put this as being with B, we use class that condensation reaction 
to create a polymer by way of bonding together by covalent bonds those monomers. So you go from monomer class to polymer by way of the condensation reaction. And you may hear me also call it by way of that dehydration synthesis reaction. Write this down now. I'll say again. The hydrolysis reaction class is the breakdown of a polymer by the addition of water into its component monomers. Whereas the condensation reaction class is, of course, the synthesis of a polymer by way of its component monomers. So that's why I put the class here with A. You go from polymer to monomer. And here in B class, you go from monomer to polymer. I'll do more with that now. Let's begin. So if you look closely, class, here at this figure, from, and this is straight from your textbook class, I'll say, this, again, this is straight from your textbook. I'll begin at the top. So I'll put a letter, uh, I'll put a letter C here, going from left to right class, I'll put a letter C here. And my C class is for condensation. So depending upon what semester it is, it might be hot outside and it might be cold. But typical of which class, let's just say it's August or July. If there's a very, 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 very cold beverage sitting outside, I like water. In fact, I could use some right now. In the event class, that that cold, cold, icy water sitting, I guess I'll say somewhere outside, whether it's on the concrete, in the grass, on the porch, wherever it may be sitting, there will be class, some form of condensation, meaning some what given off. I hope you can say class water. I'm saying this to say that by way of a condensation reaction, I'll take what is called monomer. And let's just call this monomer A. And I'll also bond together, not just monomer A, but I'll bond together monomer A with monomer B to create class polymer. What polymer? Any polymer you want. And that is the essence class of the condensation reaction, meaning the dehydration synthesis or condensation reaction class is covalently linking monomers. Water is removed during the reactions and of course that combine these monomers. So now we have that small polymer here class here on the right hand side. So I'll contrast that with what I have here next. I'm going to, of course, just erase the ink on the slide. So now let's go from right to left. So from right to left, I'll call this our hydrolysis reaction. So with our hydrolysis reaction class going from right to left, in this case, water is add it to the process, to the plus sign. So we're gonna break with water, I like to say. So polymers class can be broken down into their component monomers by adding a hydrogen ion class from the water and attaching, of course, one to this monomer and, of course, that hydroxyl or the OH from the water attaches to the other monomer. So there you have class, the hydrogen ion there, you have that hydroxyl or that OH there Breaking, bringing this back class being both monomer, I'll call it B, and monomer A. Class, this has been each of which, meaning we did firstly the condensation reaction or the dehydration synthesis reaction, and then we ended up class with our hydrolysis reaction. So you have to understand both of these two, of course, better get to where we're going. And if you don't get either of these, please let me know. Let us now continue. So what we're going now, class, are to those macromolecules, individually by group, meaning those giant molecules, those polymers class, produced by co covalently linking those small organic compounds class called monomers. So there are four classes of macromolecules, or molecules of life they are, sometimes called. The, molecule, the molecules of life class are known as carbohydrates, as you see them here. Next group class are lipids, after lipids class, we'll get to proteins, and then we'll ultimately class end with 
nucleic acids. On your lecture test class, you'll be asked to describe all four classes of molecules of life, or all four classes of macromolecules. And I, I say this because I want to make sure you all know exactly what to expect on the test, meaning this will be something that you will type out and have to look at class and be able to identify. This was something that you will write out, meaning you should know this like the back of your hand so you could write it out. And then you likely will submit this the day of the test via a homework assignment. And I'll just say it says test homework, so this is your test homework. So please write this down. Please write this down. Be able to describe. Be able to describe, class, those four. F-O-U-R, those four classes. Be able to describe those four classes of macro molecules on the test. And if you're wondering how do you do this, that's an ellipse. Be able to describe them class on the test. And the way you'll describe them class is both in, that's letter A, both in letter A. That looks horrible. To be able to describe them on your test class in both structure and function. I'm getting out my eraser at least trying to. You all should be able to describe them both in structure class and in function. So here's my A now. So both structurally and functionally. So again, I say, when you test, you have to describe the four classes of macromolecules, structurally and functionally. So that's the carbohydrates. That's the lipids, the proteins, and nucleic acids. So if you do, if you need this, I just say click pause, write it down. Otherwise, I'm moving on. This is your lecture overview class, and I'm not going to just sit here right now. We've got other places, other places to go as far as the rest of our lecture. Let us now continue. So for those who are still with me, we're now at the carbohydrates. The carbohydrates contain, of course, carbon, hydrogens, oxygens class, and the ratio here is one carbon to two hydrogens class to, of course, ten oxygens. So one carbon, two hydrogen, two of course, one oxygen. Excuse me, not ten. That's one. I said again, that's one. So for every carbon, there's an oxygen class and of course two hydrogens. So that's a one to two to one ratio. I am sorry for saying ten. It's just that O looked like a number. So let's get to our description here, class, structurally. So with this, I'll say that we have three different types, meaning as I described these, in that one to two to one ratio. I'll begin by stating that we have the monosaccharides first. You can also call those class the simple sugars. The monosaccharides, or simple sugars class, include things such as those five carbon molecules, or those pentose sugars, such as ribose, or even class the six carbon sugars, called the hexose sugars, and molecules such as glucose and fructose. And then after those, which are here, well, I'm, I'm going to step back. Let's get to a bit more information about the monosaccharides here. So when you think of the monosaccharides, think of them as being here class to provide us with cellular fuel. That's one function. Another function of which class would be here to provide us with energy storage. And I'll add to that, giving yet another function class being, of course, as a nucleic acid component. Definitely class in the case of ribose, being, of course, a component of nucleic acids. And even class, you can find this being there in the structure class of the plant cell wall. So let's go to what they look like. So if you look closely, these class are those monosaccharides. So I've given you some examples class being fructose, glucose, and even ribose. So if you look closely, class, this is showing you glucose. And there are more than just one type. There are a couple of types, class. So on the left, we have alpha glucose. On the right, class, we have beta glucose. So you're saying, wait a minute, Huff. I understand we're here with, with glucose here. I'm learning about carbohydrates, but I didn't know there were, there were more than one type. So what I'm getting to is is that we find this called beta-glucose with those one to four, I repeat, the beta-glucose 
with those one to four linkages, well, we don't have the enzymes class to digest that form. Hence, when we eat, of course, dietary fiber is amazing to have. So from here, I'll just move it on class to what's next. And as I get to what's next, I left off one small portion. I was kind of debating upon whether they included in the lecture. And I'll mention it class. I guess I'll do it rather quickly. So as I get to this, just keep in mind, class, that you could also further divide the monosaccharides class into, of course, the aldehydes and the ketones. I'll say again, you could further divide the monosaccharides into the aldehydes, and that would include ribose, glucose, and galactose, even glyceraldehyde. So I'll say again, you could divide, class, the sugars further into the aldehydes. And then, of course, the second of two groups class with the ketones. And the ketones class include fructose, ribulose, and I'll leave it at those. But don't look for me to ask every bit of that on the test because the test won't have all that on there. So the second group class is known as the disaccharides. So think of the disaccharides class as being those two sugars bonded together class covalently. And they're linked here class by glycosidic bonds i.e. what we have here class being maltose and even sucrose. So let's go on over to the disaccharides. So as we are here class, I mentioned maltose. So when you have maltose that is here bonded together, it's nothing more class than those two glucose molecules together. So next up, of course, is sucrose. And it tells you right there class, it's table sugar. So you have glucose and fructose that makes up table sugar that you all made add to a, a bowl of corn flakes. I remember I used to want uh, frosted flakes at the house when I lived with my dad and my mom. And I tell you one thing, they told me I better throw some, uh, some, some sugar on that stuff. And I promise I did. And it didn't taste the same. And even to the day class, I don't buy frosted flakes because they're quite expensive. But I do love tricks. <laughs> so up next class, we've made it down to lactose. So when you think of lactose, I hope you think of, of course, what we find in milk. And, and if you're drinking silk, that's different. Or if you're drinking, uh, I don't know, almond milk, that's also different. I hope they're not the same thing. I don't think they are. Silk must be soy. I believe so. At any rate, lactose class is nothing more than glucose and galactose bonded together. So keep these in mind because you have a test in which I'll ask you about these, both structurally class and functionally. And fourth and finally class, we have, excuse me, third and finally, we have what are known as the polysaccharides. So the polysaccharides class are the largest of which they are huge. And if you're saying, wait, 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 what do you mean? Well, what I mean, class, is they're so big that we don't draw these out. So there are many, many class repeating units here. And I guess I'll begin where your text has begun with the starches. So when you think of starch class, I think of being a form of energy storage class in plants, starch is. And I, I, I say this because I like french fries. And if you don't like french fries, well, you don't like french fries. But I like french fries. So when you eat all those french fries, well, you're eating a lot, a lot, a lot of starch from that storage root called, of course, the potato. And if you eat far too many french fries, glass will be blunt. You'll begin to get fat. Because what happens is your body takes in what you eat. I mean, you will go through the process of digestion, chemical digestion to break down class what was once starch, and of course, it'll be broken down into glucose. However, since you ate far too many fries, thanks a lot, five guys, you of course will have more glucose than you need. Well, then what your body would then do class is take that glucose and convert it into glycogen, and then you will serve that class, store that into your liver and your skeletal muscles. And that of course could lead you to getting fat because of eating so many of those fries. And boy, I gotta watch my, my fry intake, but uh, I, I sometimes can't uh, get away from it. So, yes, it's in plants, starch is, and that makes, makes me think back. Keep in mind that those disaccharides class many times are that form of sugar that is transported in plants. I forgot to mention that moments ago. I forgot to mention that moments ago. So the next type of polysaccharide that's their class is known as glycogen. So think of class glycogen as being that form of energy storage in animals. Class, that includes me and you. So I just gave you that example. When we eat class far too much, meaning far too many carbs, carbohydrates, that is, you all, we then convert that directly class into glucose. But of course, your body gets to a point at which it does not need class that ready-made glucose immediately. And that's when it class stores 
meaning that as energy. So it, could, it converts class what was once a polysaccharide into the monosaccharide, the monosaccharide that we use, class of respiration, to synthesize ATP. But once you have class far too much, it will convert that glucose into what is known as glycogen. So it says there, yes, energy storage in animals. At next class is cellulose. So this is there for structure. Yes, it's a structural component class of plant cell walls. Cellulose is. So I say again, as we eat, I said we, salad. Yes, we're eating lots and lots of green stuff. Well, that green stuff class is green because of the pigment class called chlorophyll. But what makes up the cell walls, of course, is cellulose. And that's why class, when you eat greens, when you eat kale, when you eat uh, celery, anything class that's green, it class will, of course, come right out of you because, of course, it's that dietary fiber that you and I class both need. So from here, we're moving class on to, to what is next. So I won't spend much time here, class, with this figure. I love the figure, by, by, by the way. But this is just when you class those starch granules, stained purple. And we'll have a, a sort of, yeah, a lab we'll do where a starch will stain purple. I know that class looks pretty pink. But in, in, in our lab, it will stain class purple. And that will be your indicator class of whether or not there is starch that is there. Keep that in mind for those paying attention, taking notes. I've gotten a collection already, class, so I won't necessarily get to much more of this because I've given you that about, of course, storing it in our liver class and skull the muscle. So with cellulose class, I mentioned already that we class do not have those enzymes to break down those beta one to four linkages, and that's why I've mentioned this class as being, of course, dietary fiber. And this says fibers, but I said dietary. Fiber. So from here, class, we'll keep on moving to a bit of what's next, but of course also things you'll learn later on. So I'll stop at what is called chitin. I hope you can, can say chitin, not chitin, it's called chitin. So chitin is also, class, a complex carbohydrate. And we find this class making up an exoskeleton of, of course, those orthopods from, of course, Kingdom Arcota. I'm sorry, not Kingdom. <laughs> Phylomorthopoda, kingdom animal you, you all, Phylomorthopoda. So from Phylomorthopoda class, I'm going to be blunt. It includes the insects, class Insecta. And it's not just insects, but also class includes those things that are not insects, such as crustaceans. But what I'm getting at class is that the, their exoskeletons are made up of chitin, and it's their class primarily to protect and, and ensure that they don't dry out, meaning protecting those insects class or protecting class all those arthropods more broadly from desiccation, meaning from drying out. And then lastly, class, the glycoproteins and glycolipids class are majorly important class as being parts of our cells. So now to the second of four class, we're now at the lipids. So unlike the carbohydrates, which are defined by their structure class, the lipids are pretty much, I guess I'll say, it says mm, heterogeneous, meaning they're different class. I repeat, they are different in that they're categorized class, categorized, meaning put into categories, based on the fact that they are either soluble class, meaning in non polar solvents, or they're relatively insoluble class in water. And what I'm getting at here, class, is that our lipids here, they have these properties because they consist mainly of carbon and hydrogen with few oxygen-containing functional groups. So we have those hydrophilic functional groups here, and they typically contain oxygen atoms. Therefore, our lipids class have little oxygen and tend to be tend to be hydrophobic. So as, as I've given you all of that, if you don't know how they're important class, I say get your importance right here. Meaning they're important class that make up our fats. The important class where they make up those phospholipids. The carotenoids class are types, the steroids, and even the waxes, which I won't say much about waxes, I'll be blunt. So why are they here? They're here class to provide us with energy, meaning they store so much more energy than do the carbohydrates. And of course, they're a structural component class of our cell membrane, meaning that cell membrane class, I would say is nothing more class than phospholipids. That's why it's referred to class as being that phospholipid bilayer. And then a major key class to being hormones, a special class of those known as the steroids. Let's continue on class around our lipids. First up are the fats or the triglycerols or triglycerides. So to begin their class of fats, they're a combination of glycerol and one, two, three fatty acids. 
And and what I like to do with this is draw it as, as this. So I would say this class would be that glycerol head region there. And then we have those three fatty acid pills. And I'll draw this line here so you know that that's that's and bingo. Those are those three class fatty acid pills. So that glycerol head region class, it has a, a major component of it, meaning it's actually water loving, being hydrophilic. I say again, that glycerol head region class is hydrophilic. Mm, yeah. I guess I'll say I'll put a line class and put philic. Hope you understand what I'm saying here. I say it's hydrophilic. The glycerol head region is. It's water loving. So those three fatty acid tails class are the opposite. So those three fatty acid tails class, they are hydrophobic. They are water fearing portions. But that's not all get to class. But what happens here is within this structure, within this structure class, what's within would be those double carbon linkages. So with those double bonded carbons class, it makes it unsaturated. I repeat, because of those double covalent bond linkages. So with, with me giving it to you that way, I'm going to go to your text and make sure it's made, I guess I'll say, but more easily understood. Here we go. Saturated fatty acids. So as we get to saturated fatty acids, I say these are things that you should, you should steer clear of. The reason I say you all should steer clear of these saturated fatty acids class is because they are solid class at room temperature due to those van der Waals interactions. And they are just those weak attractions, so they are strong when many occur among those long hydrocarbon chains. So they tend to make substances class more solid by limiting the motion of its molecules. So as I put it this way, I say, class, you should stay away from the saturated fats. Those saturated fats are those that will tend to clog your arteries. For instance, I don't have a, a picture of it here today, but like one time I made what are called tacos. And I don't know about you all, but my tacos aren't plant-based. Nothing wrong with a plant-based taco. In fact, uh, I once had tacos that were not plant-based. Or at least, yes. Were that tacos? I think it was tacos. At any rate, let's think of those tacos that are not plant-based. So those that are coming from, of course, beef, ground beef. After, of course, getting that beef from skillet, or at least having it in skillet, and skillet being on, yes, there is what I call a bit of oil. Well, I have that oil class in my office just for you. If you would like to see the oil, let me know. I'll bring oil class to lab, or even bring to lecture. But that oil class is in a jar that looks much class like, I guess I'll say, a jar of jelly. And it's at the top of that thing, and it's not moving. So what was once class oil is now nothing more class than fat. That is solid. That is solid class at room temperature. So if it's solid at room temperature, just imagine class what that's doing to your arteries. Not that your arteries class are necessarily at room temperature. But what I'm getting to is, is it begins to occlude. Let's just say that's the lumen. That's the L-U-M-E-N. That's the lumen of your artery. And I'll write the word lumen again. L-U-M-E-N. If that class is that lumen or opening of your artery, this class is what happens over time. Meaning it becomes occluded. And that lumen class gets, I hope you can see it, it gets smaller. And it's all based on what we're doing over time in our lives. What's up next class are those unsaturated fatty acids? So the reason class they're unsaturated fatty acids, it's by and large class based on those carbon atoms being here joined by a double bond. Meaning they're joined in this case class by a double bond which allows them class to be liquid at room temperature, typically. So I think of these classes being those, those plant oils, such as olive oil or peanut oil. So these, I say, are much more healthy for you and much more healthy class for me. And this is why I love, uh, I guess I'll just put it out there, I love going to Bonefish Grill. I mean, the bread, the pesto, watch out for carbs, though. <laughs> 
But that pesto class is most amazing because, of course, that, that oil is healthy for you and, and healthy for me. That's, that's why I say, class, we should have more of these omega-3 oils within you and within me. And I guess I'll go backwards just a bit. And I'm not just saying because, just because, class, it's plant-based. I'm not just say I'm not just because it's plant based, because there are some classes that's, that are even worse that are plant based. You say some that are worse? Yes, there are some that are worse. Meaning others that are even worse class are those that are coming from what are called coconut oil. I would say you should not at all ingest any coconut oil because coconut oil class is even worse class than some of the others. So I'll leave it at that and. I just want you to know that, that those that are saturated class, they contribute class to cardiovascular disease and they can shorten your lifespan. No, I'm sorry, not can. They likely will shorten your lifespan and increase the risk class of cardiovascular disease. So just please be mindful class of what you're eating. So with this, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll now move on class to trans fats here just shortly. So these class are typically hydrogenated or partially hydronated cooking oils. And I say, please, Ari, please, <clears throat> please watch out for these. Because by adding those hydrogen atoms, class, this is what will typically, A, make your food taste good, but class B, kill you. I remember once there was a student of mine who, <clears throat> excuse me, mentioned that, yeah, I, I love cooking that fried chicken huff. I said, I bet it tastes amazing. And, and then the, the, the person continued and said, yep, I still use lard. I said, whoa, now, lard? She said, yes. And class, I'll be honest, I would bet the bottom dollar, wherever that bottom dollar is, class, that that is the best fried chicken on earth due to the lard class used to cook it. So please be mindful, class, of the health implications based on, of course, the, of course, chemis chemical under underpinnings. But next class, I'm here at phospholipids. So the phospholipids class, I, I call them being amphipathic. The phospholipids class are amphipathic. And let's start with structure. So the basic structure class of that phospholipid is going to be with that A, glycerol head region here, and B, those two fatty acid pills. I don't know why I use AMB. At any rate, I'll draw just a bit here for you, class. So I have, I don't know how that happened. I want to get this off the screen and make this look a lot better. So now I'll draw class, glycerol head region, glycerol head, glycerol head, glycerol head, glycerol head. And I'll do the same here, draw my glycerol head regions. I think you all know where I'm going. So these glycerol heads, class, are hydro... So I'll put that line in this right, P-H-I-L-I-C, hydrophilic regions they are. As opposed to, class, the fatty acid tails. If you can think back with me, class, to where we were with the trig triglycerides or fats, I mentioned, class, that those fatty acid tails are, are what? They are hydrophobic. So I'll put a line here for each of those. And I'll write this line and write P-H-O-B-I-C, phobic. So I'm doing this to make sure you all know that that portion that's here on the outside, the glycerol heads, are water-loving, as opposed to the inner portion here, class, being water-fearing, making this, of course, an amphipathic molecule, making, class, that cell membrane selectively permeable. Because everything that tries to get in class will not be allowed in. And that's why we refer to this as being class, that lipid by layer. So you have the layer class here at the top and the layer class here at the bottom. So it's this in and of itself is why class, our cells are so selective. So as you look at this, yes, there is water here. Hey, water loving. And there is water here. Hey, water loving. However, what's between class being those fatty acid pills is what makes this thing selective, not allowing class everything to enter the cell, not allowing class everything to exit that cell. So I'll continue on from here, class, with those carotenoids. So the carotenoids are pigments, typically. 
Now, I mentioned these pigments. I like to think of these glass, especially in plants, as being, of course, those accessory pigments involved glass in photosynthesis, allowing that electromagnetic spectrum, allowing glass, that plant, to use more of that spectrum instead of just using glass, those blues and those reds, allowing it to use more glass, being using those oranges, glass, and those yellows. And this is what you all see in the fall, meaning as fall comes, yes, those leaves do go through the process of, of abscission, meaning forming an abscission layer class and falling off. Well, as those leaves do fall off class, you begin to see those carotenoids. And the next portion I'll get to class is being that the carotenoids, they are insoluble in water and have a bit of an oily consistency. But what makes this class even more important is vitamin A. So vitamin A class is what will be converted glass to that visual pigment known as retinol. Meaning we must have retinol. Meaning without retinol glass, <laughs> sight wouldn't be seen. Meaning we couldn't see what we see. So just keep this in mind, class. And so we use that retinol to allow us to be able to see everything that we can see. And you'll learn more about that in the event that you take anatomy and physiology. So just keep in mind, class, that the carotenoids, along with vitamin A and retinol, they all have that pattern class of double bonds that alternate with single bonds. So these are majorly important class in the absorption class of light and, of course, the reflecting of other light waves. So next with class, we're here at steroids. The steroids class, they're very different in structure. I'll just, well, I'll kind of draw it a bit. I was thinking of a figure here, and I don't see the figure that I would like to give you other than what's in my brain. So let's begin. So I'll draw a class. Typically, a steroid has four rings. As it states, steroids consist of carbon atoms arranged in four attached rings. So I'll, I'll draw these, or I'll give you a, an attempt to draw these. So you have this that's here, and you have that that's there, and you have that there, that there. And I'll draw the very same beside it, class. So we have this that's here, there, whoops, there, there. And then I'll draw my next two, just like this. Yes, I'm drawing over the, the words, which I hope you all don't mind. That's that's there, and that that's there. And that looks a bit ugly, but at least I think you get my drift. And then I'll go here, and then there. So what I've drawn for you now, class, is that basic structure of a steroid. Yes, I did it just like that. So as I've done this, we use these steroids, class, in a number of ways. I would say these, class, would make your life what it is right now. Even though you might not appreciate them yet, I know for a fact you'll begin to appreciate them. I'm saying, what do you mean? Steroids, class, are important in cholesterol. Cholesterol, class, is a major component, class, of the cell walls. I mean, I'm sorry, not your cell walls, but I mean your cell membranes, excuse me. Your cell membranes class aren't hard. I just hit the computer. They're pliable. They have a bit of give here and there. And we must have cholesterol because our cell membrane class that's here has to have it to allow not just appropriate cell transport, but just to be that part of the cell. But then again, you do not want your cholesterol class to be too much. Meaning if you have excess cholesterol in your blood, it can then, of course, also class form lipid plaque buildup meaning you do not want high cholesterol because that could cause you all to form blood clots when, of course, a person who is, I guess I'll say, just as healthy, who has a lower cholesterol, would not, of course, form those blood clots, the occluded arteries. So next up, class, is going to be, I guess I'll move on down to bile salts. We must have those bile salts. So when I think of bile salts, class, I think of the large intestine. Well, those bile salts are their class to, of course, emulsify fats or to, of course, break down those fats. Without that class, your life would be gone because, of course, you couldn't break down those, break down those essential fats that you and I indeed need. With that class, next, I'll say those hormones. You say hormones? Definitely so, such as testosterone or even class estrogen. I'll leave it at those two hormones, but we must have those sex hormones, and they're a class here being steroid-based. Along with that class, we have a number of other hormones, such as cortisol. Cortisol is a major steroid hormone, and many of those drugs class taken over, I wouldn't say over the counter, but those that are prescribed class are steroid hormones that we must have. And then these, since they are class steroid based, they can class pass directly across, or repeat, directly across the cell membrane. So these class are the steroids, and I won't try to give you everything about them. That's enough. Up next class are all the proteins. 
now we've got the proteins. What I'll say about these is, I forgot one thing about the steroids class. I don't know how I forgot about steroids. But going back to steroids, I have it written down in my notes. They're a major component class for what is called vitamin D. I'm going back because this is important. So you must have class the steroid. You must have vitamin D. Because without vitamin D class, I'll repeat, without vitamin D, we cannot class absorb calcium. So I say again, vitamin D is required class for calcium absorption. And calcium class is required for most contraction. Calcium class is required for neurotransmission, meaning to not just get the nerve impulse, but to allow those nerve impulses to, to of course, go from neuron class to neuron. So I, I'm sorry I forgot this and went back, but I have to do this. We must have class the steroid, vitamin D. And if you're wondering how to get it, well, you get vitamin D class meaning outside in the sun, meaning by way of your skin, we synthesize vitamin D, which, of course, is required class for the absorption of calcium. So keep that in mind. We have to have that. Now back to my notes. This is the, the proteins. So proteins class, by and large, are made by what are known as the amino acids. So let's get to the types of proteins. I guess I'll do these very quickly. Not to go fast, but I'm going to do these very quickly. So the types of proteins that exist class are those that are enzymatic or enzymes. Not all proteins are enzymes. However, class, many are enzymes. So to help you all with what an enzyme does is an enzyme class is what catalyzes chemical reactions. And in other words, I can say that enzyme is what speeds up. It speeds up class the rate of those chemical reactions. Or I can say it another way, class, is that what enzymes do is they lower the activation energy. Or the energy class of activation, I just put E sub A. They lower the energy of activation, meaning, I guess I'll do this a bit quicker here. Let's say that that's time at the bottom. And then this is the energy of activation class that's here. For instance, let's say that you have this begins here and it goes down to there. And then you have this that begins here and it goes down to there. There. I would hope you say, let's call this A, let's call this B. That getting from number one to number two, getting class from number one to number two. I hope that you all can see that in A, it takes longer to get from one to two than it does class in B. What you could say, class, is, is that if that's that very same reaction, that B proceeds class more quickly than does A, using class less activation energy. That's what enzymes do in order to keep us class to not having to have a fever class to, of course, process everything we're doing, meaning by processing, by breaking down class, the things we take in to eat. We could not live class without enzymes because they are, as I would say, majorly important class into lowering that energy of activation and speeding up class the rate of reactions. Up next class, proteins can be structural proteins that, of course, may be their class to provide us with structure such as collagen class in our hair, or collagen class even in our skin, and even keratin class. Next up, proteins can be there for storage, such as storage class in, I guess all your text says eggs, especially class by way of the ovalbumin in the egg white, and even in seeds. Proteins can be used for transport, such as the transport proteins class that are embedded in their plasma, the plasma membrane of cells allowing those substance class that are too large to fit through that plasma membrane to go class with that transport protein to facilitate class cellular transport. Up next class are regulatory proteins. And as being that, it says some protein hormones do exist. So the hormones such as insulin, yes. You may say, you mean a hormone is a protein? Definitely correct. And even class some that control gene expression because not all your cells class have every gene turned on. It's just not possible. Yes, they have all those A's, T's, G's, and C's, meaning all of those components of adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, but not every gene class is on in every cell. And then we have proteins class that move, such as actin and myosin, meaning allowing you to move. Those are two class, I guess you would call those proteins that are there to allow contraction to occur, family muscles, actin and myosin are, 
And finally, class, proteins that are here to protect. And I will think about these classes being the antibodies, meaning once there is an antigen, such as, I guess I'll say, some bacterial infection, such as some viral infection, well, upon class getting over such, you can then, class, create antibodies, which, of course, are proteins. And since you're all in my class, I'll just tell you, class, we, meaning you, being me, you and I, we, class, can create an infinite number, class, of antibodies. The only thing is, is that you must, of course, first be exposed to it, or, of course, be vaccinated. So from here, let's keep on rocking to where we're going. So the next portion I'll get to, class, as far as proteins are concerned, is that just do not forget that you could very well class a protein a polypeptide. Keep in mind, class, that there are peptide bonds that, of course, bond together these amino acids. So I kind of drew this for you all earlier. I'm going to draw this again one more time, and I'm just going to draw it a bit differently here. I'll begin, class, still with our amine group here, our NH2. Still, I'll begin with our amine group, our NH2. However, this time, bonded to our, our nitrogen class will be a carbon. And here, class, will be our hydrogen. That's it. And, oh boy, how did that happen? Here, class, will be our... It's not letting me write. Thank you. I am now writing again. So there's our hydrogen. Here is our R group. And then yet again, we'll go to our carboxyl group. So here is our carbon, our double bonded uh, uh, oxygen, and then ending with class, the hydroxyl group. There we have it. So this class is our acid group here in green. This is our acid group in blue. This class is our R group. R as in R. Class here in blue. This is our R group. The R group class is what gives each amino acid its unique properties. The R group does. And then I'll draw a class here, and I guess I'll go with an orange triangle. That class is the amine group. And this class is an amino acid. And I think you all should remember that from where we were before. I'll just put class the amine group and draw it with an arrow. So having done this this way, you should keep this in mind because you should look class with that amino acid and those amino acid units, they could be enzymes, they could be structural, they could be muscle protein, or even class found in hemoglobin. So it's a number of different functions class that our proteins carry out. And I won't go through all of those now. We'll do more with those a bit later. And we will not class go through all of the amino acids, meaning there are 20 types of amino acids that are found in proteins. And... There is no need, class, for you all to even remember all of the types of amino acids. I mean, all of the amino acids. But, but it, it, your book does give you 20 common types. But what I'll get to here briefly, class, is the way in which this occurs. And, and what I mean is, to get to amino acids, we have to go through the way in which they're created. And the way that they are created, class, is by going through, being joined together, class, by those covalent bonds. So I already mentioned class the peptide bonds. Well, the peptide bond is nothing more than that covalent bond, and it's going to be that covalent carbon to nitrogen bond that links, of course, those two amino acids. So the way we get their class, meaning to make these amino acids, and I'm going through this because I've already given you that class, is going to this portion here. So to get to amino acids, or at least proteins being formed, you begin class with the primary sequence of amino acids. I'll say again, the primary sequence of amino acids. You might even see me write it as being one prime, the primary structure. So that's just the amino acid number one, amino acid number two, amino acid number three, amino acid number four. And let's just say if this protein class only has 29 amino acids, that will be, of course, going from amino acid number one to amino acid 29. Then from their class, you get to that tertiary structure. So that tertiary structure, of course, could be written as Three prime, of course, will depend upon those side chain interactions. So when I think about that tertiary structure, I think about that it, the, the protein class becoming 3D, 
beginning class to fold, kind of like what you're seeing here. And if you want to see a protein, just let me know and I can put up a protein. May I maybe put up a TP53, that gene that is responsible for class for most types of cancers. It's their class because it should suppress, of course, tumors. But, of course, in the event that it happens to be mutated class, then, of course, pro tumor suppression class will not occur. I mean, that's just, I said, I said TP53. So I could show you that protein if any of you all are interested in seeing it, meaning what it actually looks like. And then from their class, we get to that secondary structure. And with the secondary structure being, of course, that's a two prime, we have a class there, that alpha helix, the alpha helix, so of course that's not a helix yet, but it'll begin to be a helix class when I draw again, the alpha helix class or the beta pleated sheet. So this happens class all because of the hydrogen bonds that are involved in that protein structure. So the alpha helix class is where that protein chain just begins to be helical or coiled and those hydrogen bonds that form between the oxygen and that partial negative charge of the hydrogen. And when that beta pleated sheet occurs, it's because, of course, the protein turning back on itself over and over again, zigzagging there. And then finally, class, we get to that the quaternary structure. And the quaternary structure class is when you have more than one, more than one protein bonded together, such as in the case of you having class hemoglobin, with those, of course, differing heme groups that we have there. And you'll see that class shown to, shown to you in the text with that beta chain from the beta globin and the alpha chain from that alpha globin and, of course, those heme groups from that, of course. So next up is showing you what I just got finished with class. So this is that primary structure of some polypeptide. Up next, it mentioned that secondary structure class with the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheet. Thirdly, class, that three-dimensional coding that occurs class from the interaction of those R groups. And then, finally, class, you get to the quaternary structure, where you have two or more polypeptide chains, such as when I mentioned, hemoglobin class, and even collagen with those three different protein chains, or polypeptide chains. So from here, I won't stay here, class, about in vitro or in vivo. I'll get next to class to denaturing a protein, and I'm almost done with proteins, class. So when it gets to denaturing proteins, class, because proteins are so large, class, they class are subject to, of course, those large physical properties, such as heat. Heat class can denature protein. And once that protein has become denatured class, it loses both structure and function. And of course, if it's lost at structure and function class, that does indeed mean the protein will no longer function. pH class can definitely affect proteins <clears throat> as well as whether or not class they will function. So if you think of the class of proteins that are in the stomach, yes, those proteins in the stomach class, they operate at their optimum. Give me just a second here. So I'll call this pH. I'll say let's just go with 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13. pH, let's begin. So thinking of pH class of the stomach, and that's pH. And it's going to be, I call this enzyme activity. Enzyme activity. So we have that. And let's go and draw this. So that does that. And then let's go over to this, and let's say this does that. So given that, I hope it's pretty well understood, class, that those two different proteins, meaning the protein that's in green and the protein that is purple, I hope you would agree and say that, yes, they would function class differently. In the body class, we have proteins that are found in the stomach. Those proteins found class in the stomach are definitely class going to operate at an optimal condition that I would say class is going to be different from class where we would find, I guess I'll put stomach here, where we would find class in the small intestine. Because in the small intestine class, the pH there is certainly different. So if enzyme class from stomach 
were to get into the small intestine, it would most definitely class become denatured because, of course, the pH of the small intestine would be pretty much 7, meaning be more neutral than the pH class of the stomach. So this is important to know class, I say, and I would put in your everyday lives. And the reason I say this is because of this is what underlies class, everything happening in the body. So up next class, we get on down to the fourth and final group. And our fourth and final group class is known as the nucleic acids. So there are only two types of nucleic acids. So to take myself back before I go too fast, I'll say that nucleic acids class transmit hereditary information and determine class what proteins a cell manufactures. So the two classes of, of nucleic acids class are deoxyribonucleic acid, known as DNA, and ribonucleic acid class, known as RNA. In function class, deoxyribonucleic acid, it makes up hereditary material of the cell, meaning the genes, and contains instructions class for making proteins and RNA. On the converse class, what ribonucleic acid does is it's used in the processes class that link amino acids class to form polypeptides. I'll say this class in a, in a, in a different way, so to speak. Think of DNA class being what stores your hereditary information, period. It's a long-term molecule. It's for storage. And it lasts a very long time. I mean, like one time, you may have heard of King Tut. Well, King Tut's DNA class still exists because, it's, of course, it's his DNA. However, class Tut's RNA doesn't exist. It's a short-term molecule. You use class simply to, of course, synthesize proteins. And that's why it's there. So the small building block that makes up this large polymer known class as the nucleic acid is the nucleotide. And before your class, it shows you what's, what the nucleotide is made of. So a nucleotide class is made of three things. One, it's called a five carbon sugar or pentose sugar. So I'll draw this here being classed at five carbon sugar. And I say five carbons because those carbons class are numbered from one to five. So always and forever class attached right here will be that nitrogen containing base. So let's just call this, uh, let's go with A for adenine. So A for adenine. And what's, of course, attached, meaning you have two out of three. You have the first class being that five carbon sugar, and then one or more phosphate groups, which I didn't mention. So let's draw that phosphate group. So boom, boom, there is that phosphate group. So the phosphate group class will always be there at number five. And... I'm saying things that may not make sense, so I'm going to make this make a lot more sense to you all. Because I've mentioned numbers, and you might say, wait, where is, where is he getting these numbers? So I'll go with green. Green's been showing up pretty well. So this is carbon number one, carbon number two, carbon number three, carbon number four, and carbon number five. This will make sense class a bit later, but there you go. This class is nothing more than a nucleotide, and I'll leave it at that for now. We'll get more specific in just a moment. So nitrogen is basis class. So I, I spoke to that being class there for the maddening. So, I hope you're taking your notes, class, and taking notes well. So, for DNA, of course, it contains four nitrogen bases, just as RNA contains four nitrogen bases. And I'll get class to the, to the difference between the two here in just a moment. So, with that, the nitrogen bases class are as follows. So, there will always class B, two purines, and two pyrimidines. So, two purines, meaning our purines class for DNA, they are adenine and guanine. Adenine and guanine are the purines. So the pyrimidines are going to be class cytosine and thymine. The pyrimidines are going to be cytosine and thymine. So I'll put pyrimidines. The pyrimidines, and that's not dine, that's dean, are going to be cytosine and thymine. So there will always, I repeat, there will always class B one, I repeat, there will always class B one purine bonded to class one pyrimidine. So for DNA, base pairing is as follows. Adenine class will always pair with thymine, and guanine class will always pair with cytosine. That is base pairing class for DNA. If you write that down and get it, class, you'll never forget it. A's will always get a T's, and G's will always get a C's. So to contrast things, class, RNA is a bit different in that, yes, RNA still has two purines, and two pyrimidines, and there will still always be one purine class with one pyrimidine. However, in this case class, what we have here is going to be that A, RNA class. I haven't really said it yet, but RNA is going to be single-stranded. 
and I said it's a short-term molecule that's your class primarily for protein synthesis. Well, in RNA, adenine class will always be paired with U, called uracil. I repeat, uracil. Adenine will always be paired class with the pyrimidine uracil. And, of course, guanine class will still be paired with cytosine. So I've given you now class Shargoff's rule. So at the top class, base pairing for DNA. The bottom class is base pairing for RNA. So to get structural class, just here quickly, and we're just about done with this lecture. To get structural class, it's that, that DNA is a double helix. I think you all have known that for a very long time. Thanks a lot of technology. So if this were to be DNA class, it's a double helix as opposed to RNA. RNA class is going to be a single helix, and that looks pretty poor and ugly. I guess I should have drawn it maybe like this. I've seen this drawn in such a way before somewhere. Yeah, that's DNA, or DNA-ish. And then, of course, RNA is just a single strand. So there we have it, class. So if you look closely in structure class, when you think of class the purines and the pyridines, the purines class have that single ring, I'm sorry, the purines have a double double ring or two rings, the purines do, as opposed to class those permadines that of course have one ring, that single ring. So these class are those nitrogenous bases. And along with that class, keeping the nucleotides are an important class for adenosine triphosphate. I'll stay with the top portion here because that top portion is the most important one. This class is that, um, I guess I'll say our molecular currency class for energy, or at least I'll put it as being class, this is energy in you, and energy in me class is known as adenosine triphosphate. So by writing it in such a way, class, this is how we get our energy, by way of the process of respiration. So by way of cellular respiration class, that is what we use to power everything you do. From me talking class, from me standing here now, and from you class listening there on your computer or listening there class on your phone taking notes. You're using ATP class to fuel everything within the body. So to make sure I reiterate class, which you all should know, I'll put it as being this. Make sure you class can go through these four using no nodes. And I said those four because something's missing off. What's missing class are the nucleic acids. The nucleic acids are missing there. So what you all should be able to do is go through the carbohydrates, the lipids, the proteins, and nucleic acids and be able to describe those class in both structure and function and be able to identify class what they look like, of course. So I would hope this lecture has made sense to you. If it has not, let me know. In the meantime, class, this is your instructor, Scholar Huff. Please study well. And of course, up next will be Chapter 4, and that chapter class is all about cells.